pleasure to be back uh, here with tonight. This is my third visit here. Uh, each time I come uh, 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 to the Boston. Uh, my jacket is making this noise. I'm going to take it I have to admit that when she asked, when she knew I would be coming for a board meeting, she asked me to speak. Uh, just a, a quick note. She said, you were speaking to a few students. Uh, and I look out here, and it's, this is a very impressive crowd. Uh, expecting a few students, I didn't make any formal or very formal remarks, uh, but I did make a few notes about a couple things I want to talk about. And, I, and one of the things in my job that I really do enjoy is talking to students. I've had a chance to talk to uh, business school students across the U.S. I've, I've spoken to students at, at Harvard Business School, at, at, uh, at Yale, at, um, uh, at Princeton. Uh, all across the U.S., and I really enjoy talking about what we do. Because uh, even though I am in the business, even if I'm in the sports profession, it really is a business. And what I'd like to do is maybe in the 20 or so minutes that I have allotted myself, uh, talk about a couple of things. Number one, I talk about what I do. I found that when I talk to students uh, like you, some of the difficult questions that come up is I'm trying to understand not only what I do, but how I got to be where I am today, what kind of career path to take to get to, to this position. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit, and then uh, I'll kind of wrap up. This is general observation. Yeah. She did ask me to talk about. She asked me at one point who my favorite, what my favorite book on management was, and I really have to confess I haven't read a book on management in quite some time. When you're in the business, I've learned it as you go along. Uh, but I thought about that question, and I thought it would be useful for me, maybe for your, on your behalf, to just talk about a couple observations about management in general. Uh, things I've learned along the way that, that uh, kind of brought in the depth of sports professors I'll share with you. Um, so just to start, you know, my background is, uh, uh, goes back to, as a college student, I was an accountant. Uh, my goal was to be a CPA. Uh, I remember learning about the profession uh, when I was in high school, uh, 10th, 10th, 11th grade, uh, and I didn't know what a CPA was at the time. And this family friend was a CPA, and he told me about it, and I thought, I was very good at math, loved numbers, uh, and at one point I thought about being a math major, but I couldn't quite figure out how to make any money doing that, uh, other than teaching. I didn't really want to teach. Uh, and so I heard about this field of accountancy, and I thought this would be a great place to, uh, to, to start. And so I really took a focus towards accounting. Uh, went through a traditional accounting program with the University of Virginia, uh, founded by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and. Uh, just after I finished, I took the CPA exam and passed the exam. But along the way, before I actually ended up, uh, 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 as I was going through that process, I also became aware of an MBA program. Now, as a college student, you don't really think about being a CP, about anything other than just following the accounting path. But I heard about a presentation uh, from the Harvard Business School and became intrigued with it. They have they teach the case method. You may be familiar. I'm not quite familiar with it here, but you probably do get involved in cases, and you probably use a few Harvard Business School cases, I imagine. Uh, I became, I studied, like you all did as an undergrad, I may have, as an undergrad, I studied Harvard Business School cases, and became a creep at school, and decided I wanted to pursue an MBA. In fact, what's interesting is, as a quick sidebar, I would interview with all the big accounting firms, and everyone I talked to, uh, all the people I interviewed with, all had, all had the MBA. Now I'm getting my undergrad degree in accounting, and I would say, by the way, do you think I should get an MBA? They said, no, you don't need one. I thought, get an MBA. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not sure why they said that, but I just thought, you know what, if, if they've got one, I think I should probably pursue one as well. And that's what put them on the, on the, on the path to all get a lot of Harvard Business School and got accepted to Harvard Business School. Uh, I took the CPA exam while I was there. And I mentioned that only to say that when I was going through that program, it really kind of broadened my perspective. You know, as an accounting student, and I love accounting, and I actually think accounting is, in fact, as one of the textbooks I studied, that accounting is a language of business. If you haven't had a lot of accounting, you ought to take more accounting because ultimately, no matter what field it's going to be in, be it marketing, be it finance, uh, uh, even management, at some point there's an analytics involved. And understanding accounting and, and that part of the business, I think, is very important. Uh, but that put me on a track away from just pure accounting and, and, and becoming a CPA to really becoming, uh, as I view myself, a person who has a kind of financial professional with a specialty in accounting. And it was really that exposure in the MBA program that really kind of broadened my horizon. Um, my career started initially as a, as a uh, consultant, as a management consultant, 
ended up working for, uh, at that time, the, uh, uh, the telecom company MCI. That you may be too young to remember who that company is at this point, but MCI is a predecessor to a lot of the, to the international long-distance company competition took place in the U.S. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about the leaders that I work for that really helped shape my own views about management. Um, but I ended up working, going from there to, from MCI, I worked doing financial analysis, becoming a very traditional MBA graduate working in analysis, working on uh, very traditional projects, to uh, leaving and working for a, a company down in, in Florida, uh, a, a transportation company called Rider System. Doing the MA work, Matt, Matt, uh, doing uh, mergers and acquisitions. And from there, I ended up uh, getting my first job in CPA as, as a CFO with the Miami, uh, in, this is in Florida, in the Miami Dimension Business Bureau. And what that did for me, and I mentioned this to people, uh, to kids, students, you know, kids, students in your position, just talk about career transition. Uh, for me, it went, I went from being an analyst, being a very, very diligent, you know, cracking you know, spreadsheets, doing analysis, that all of a sudden, to slowly try to move my career to the point I was about, overseeing the financial organization. That was my career goal, and that's kind of how I ended up where I am today. I went from that CFO job to, with the Miami Convention and Business Bureau, to all the game involved in sports. Um, now let me just ask, how many of you are familiar with baseball generally? U.S. baseball? Okay, I don't know what happened I saw my first cricket match uh, about three years ago uh, in uh, South Africa. Was that 08, I think it was? 08, 09? Yeah. IPL. And, uh, and I was really kind of intrigued with how similar the sports are. Um, we think in, our, in my profession, you know, there are four major professional sports uh, in the U.S. You know, uh, what we call football. Some of this corrected me. I was in. Uh, Dubai a couple of days ago, and I was corrected. It should not be called football because no one ever uses their feet; they always use their hands. And not football, but football, basketball, baseball, and hockey are four major sports. Uh, soccer is slowly coming up, um, but we think of baseball as being America's sport, America's pastime. It, it is over 160 years old. Uh, it's a long time sport. Um, but I got involved with it. I did not follow. It. And this is something else I always point out. I did not. Get, I was not, Did not follow. Did not play baseball. Growing up, I played basketball and football. Uh, and I point that out just to say that what I do as a business uh, had nothing to do with what I do in the field. Now, if I was involved in talent evaluation, which you've got people that does that, you know, uh, then it would be very different. Perhaps I didn't play the game with matter. But I, I point that out to say that to be good at what you do, and as I look at my own career, having worked in telecommunications, transportation, uh, travel trade, and now professional sports, my job really hasn't changed that much. I've always been involved in finance, and that's been a common thread that goes around. And I point that out to students to make it clear that you know you should really focus on being good in a functional area without necessarily trying to be focused on a particular industry. People that I talk to, a lot of students I talk to, say we work in sports, and my advice to them is: if you work in sports, become good at something. Uh, be it you know if you want to go take a legal path, be good at labor law or contract law. Uh, if you want to study, you know, management, uh, uh, the field of management, the organizational behavior, that's a path to running the human resources department of sports team. Uh, if you want to be good in finance, then you can follow the path I follow. But it really doesn't matter which field you go into. And so I ended up where I am in sports, uh, having been in those other industries, primarily because I decided to focus my career on being good at finance and accounting. And that's kind of broadening my, my, my vision just from, not just from county, but from a much broader, from a much broader area. And so what ended up happening was, while I was working in that first CFO job that I had, uh, with one of the real important differences being uh, moving from doing the analysis. When I was in those previous jobs, my boss would give me the assignment. And I had some people working under me, but ultimately, you were doing a very, very specific function once I became CFO, it really kind of broadened my perspective. And now I'm thinking about the entire organization. I described the CFO role as being a, 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 a place where you really have to think about how your job affects the other parts of the organization. And I'll come back to that as I talk about some mission observations. Um, but essentially, the basic baseball, the industry that I work in, decided to add two new franchises, one in Miami, 
uh, and one at that time in Denver, Colorado. And in starting the franchise, the owner of the, of the franchise, Wayne Eisinger, so I hired people, and I saw an ad in the paper, or an article in the paper about the CFO job that wasn't built, and I called a friend who I thought knew the organization, and she did. She gave my resume to that person, to, to, to the organization, to, to the, that baseball team, the Florida Marlins, the name of the team. And they called me the next day, put in. And I always tell that story when I talk to students, just to underscore the value of networking. You know, people talk about how important it is to get your resume written and to send out letters, and all that is all true. But ultimately, I found that the best one of the best ways to really get a job is to keep that network going. And so that's what got me into sports. It wasn't my long-term desire to work in sports. It wasn't because I sent out resumes. It's simply you know, seeing an opportunity and using my professional network to 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 to, uh, to, to pursue it. It turned out to be the case. Uh, I went from being the CFO for that sports team to also being CFO of the entire league. Um, the league is tough. Uh, we've got 30 teams across the league. Um, you all heard of a few of our teams, the York Yankees. Everyone, everyone knows the Yankees. Uh, you know, if this were a marketing course, we could talk about branding. Uh, and the Yankees would be at the top, uh, without question. Um, but, um, um, so, uh, so, oh, so just to believe, we have 30 teams, uh, collectively $7 billion, really $7.5 billion industry. Uh, it's quite large. Um, it is more than just, a, again, it is really a big business, and there are various aspects about it that really help drive it. Uh, beyond the game of the field, uh, and it's kind of interesting looking at how you know, American sports differs from European sports from how it's marketed uh, and how we make money, how we generate money. But the three or four biggest revenue generators for our business, uh, first and foremost, and most obviously, is skate. You know, game receipts. It's what happens in the state itself. Selling tickets, uh, selling beer, selling popcorn, uh, uh, all of the state-related activity, you know, attached to fans is a big part of our game. That's probably about a third of our revenue. Uh, it varies from team to team, but on, on average, it's about a third of our revenue comes from the game. So really, promoting the game is very important for us. Um, another big part of business is TV. Um, and, you know, I, I know across the globe, you know, it's become a huge revenue driver for almost all professional sports. That's a big part of our game as well. That's about 25 to 30 percent, again, depending upon the market. Uh, our game is a little bit different than, than American football in that, in our game, uh, the local teams have a lot of control of their TV rights, whereas in the uh, National Football League, they have almost all their contracts controlled nationally. And so if you have in our game, this is what separates our sport and our business model from uh, other uh, professional sports in America, is that the size of the market matters. If you're in New York City, you, get a, you have a large TV market, since you control a lot of the inventory, that really helps drive your revenue number, which gives you an advantage perhaps to other teams. Uh, I don't know a lot about Premier football, uh, Premier League football, but that, you know, in a very simple way, the bigger markets with the bigger TV contracts tend to really get the better players. And that's something that really we fight with in terms of trying to create competitive balance. Uh, we don't have relegation, and so we want every team to basically be, to be competitive at some point. But TV money is a big part. And then the last piece uh, of our business model really involves um, uh, signage, advertising, promotions. It's getting sponsors involved. And sponsors involved, and what makes sports so interesting, especially in our, in our, in our market, sponsorships are important because ultimately you're trying to get sponsor dollars, but they're trying to get fans. And so they're using our fans to really attract their customers. Uh, and so that's kind of the broad based business model that we have in our country, and it's what really helps drive my job. So stepping back, um, you know, I talk about this not being more than just a, just a sports school business. It gets back to what I do every day. And um, a big part of what I do is collect revenue. Collect revenue. Uh, as a CFO, uh, I mentioned it's a $7 billion business. You know, we uh, have national TV contracts. We've got sponsors, contracts with major sponsors, Pepsi and Gatorade, uh, some of the other big you know, banks, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, that's a big part of what I do. But there's other parts that also uh, take up my time. Uh, uh, this room, I also mentioned risk management. Uh, 
sitting in a base, you know, one of the interesting things about going to a baseball game is that, now, how many of you have ever been to a baseball game? Any? Anyone in here? Probably not. One, if you watch the game, what's interesting about a baseball game, uh, the thing that most people, most fans, beyond the team winning, really wants more than anything else, they want to catch the baseball. <laughs> You know, it's a home run in the stands and people scramble for the catch of baseball. Invariably, in that scramble, somebody gets hurt. Or worse yet, someone's talking on the cell phone, they're working on a Blackberry, whatever, and a ball hits them. And, of course, the first thing you want to do is you want to sue somebody. At least in these days. Uh, but risk management is a big part of what we do. And, you know, one of these that I did when I joined the league office, and I've been in this job now for 10 years, uh, came in 2002. Uh, we put together a risk management program, a league-wide risk management program, where all the teams now are part of one program. Beforehand, each team had their own insurance policy. Uh, and interestingly, I, I took the job in, 2000, in, in March 2002, which was about six months after the September 9-11 uh, tragedy. And one of the things that happened, as you, as you think about it, was that the insurance market became very, very tight. It became very, very hard to get insurance at that point. Uh, and what people don't even think about was that beyond the liability insurance that ensued from that disaster, uh, workers' compensation insurance was an issue. Because everybody in those buildings, they were working. And under the workers' compensation laws in the U.S., uh, any worker that's injured for some of the employment, they automatically compensated. That market all of a sudden became hit. And the point of all that is that we put together and what I realized we needed to do was to kind of put the league under one umbrella. And so risk management under one umbrella is what we now do, manage. And for that fan that's sitting in the ballpark and gets hit by baseball, uh, we have some pretty nasty injuries, uh, we have to settle those claims. So one, I've got someone in my office against risk management. Uh, by the same token, if there's any other litigation taking place uh, across the league where there's some insurance exposure, I manage that as well. Treasury activity. Uh, we probably have over a billion dollars of excess cash right now. It's got to be managed. I put together an advisory board to help us manage our cash. Uh, raising capital. Our team being funded. Yes, we put together a league-wide program to use the, the kind of the size of our league to go to banks and create much more attractive financing for teams to be able to borrow money to help finance their operations. So there's a broad, broad range of activities that I get involved in. Uh, again, just to make the point that it's more than just a, a, a sports, it's a little business. Um, just to, to, to go to the, to, to, to the second topic I want to talk about, you know, what the, you know, what Mr. Austin asked me to do, you know, what, what are my observations about or my favorite books or thoughts about management? And when she asked me that, a couple of thoughts. First of all, um, I was thinking about, in my mind, just opposing you know, business versus politics. Um, what's interesting about business, from my perspective, versus politics, politics, as I see it, is kind of a zero-sum game. Someone has to win, someone has to lose. And worse than that, uh, typically, it's done in a way where one side wants to actually hurt the other side in order to gain an advantage. Uh, from my perspective, what makes business work is when you have what I call win-win win -win opportunities, when people are kind of working together to try to accomplish something, as opposed to trying to, you know, you've got competitors out there, of course, you want to beat the marketplace, and that's fair game. But the organization itself, what makes, uh, I think, business work, and, what's, and from my, my observation about management, what makes it work is when you, when you get an organization to work together in order to reach goals that satisfy multiple constituencies. In fact, there's a quote that I, that I saw that I thought really captured. It's a very simple quote, and I can't recall who said it. But it basically says, you can do anything you want if you just help enough other people do everything they want. Read that again. You can do anything you want if you just help enough other people do everything they want. And that's, as I look at my career, that's how you know, people ask me, how do I get to where I am today? It is taking that approach. I look at the people I've worked with, I'll mention a couple in a second. It's really, that's been kind of the underlying thing. In my role as a CFO, uh, I've got responsibilities. I've got to get financial statements done. I've got to get, you know, money 
invested. I've got to get a lot of things done. And ultimately, I have to rely on other people in the organization to do that. And for me to be successful, I've got to understand what their goals are, what their needs are. Um, but I, you know, I, I had a friend of mine who, who got a job as a CFO uh, early in his career, and he called me up and he wanted to know uh, uh, some tips on on uh, on how to be effective. And I said, you have to think about what you're doing. As a CFO, you're really providing information to the people in marketing to help them basically get their job done, get things sold, to get to, to, to reach certain markets, etc. Uh, if it's the operations group, you've got to be able to give them financial statements. On a timely basis, that's important, on a timely basis, to allow them to meet their objectives. And so, to be successful, to get what you want done, you've got to basically make sure that everyone is getting what they want done as well. And I, as I thought about people I've worked for, uh, uh, I thought that they really kind of understood that more than other, you know, some of the successful people I've worked for, understood more so than other people that have not been successful. And a couple that come to mind, uh, I'll share with you, uh, is Bill McGowan. And they may not be anything to any of you all right now if you were to move the same. I ain't sure what they say about it. Uh, but Bill McGowan was the founder of MCI, Telecommunications. Uh, MCI, um, you know, back in the, you know, started back in the 80s, early 80s, uh, and in the U.S. market, there was only one carrier. And that's probably true in many countries in Europe and Asia particularly today. But there's only one international carrier, one long distance carrier. It's AT&T. And we all heard of AT&T, probably heard of AT&T, but they've only, yeah, it's of course, sort of. And AT&T at the time, the U.S. owned everything. The local telephone markets in every city, they controlled. They controlled the long distance markets. And they also control most of the research. A lot of research has come out of the, uh, out of the marketplace, came out of Bell Labs, um, and that's Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, they didn't think own the market. And Bill McGowan was this guy, this upstart guy, uh, that decided he was going to compete against AT&T. I mean, you talk about a David and Goliath story. Um, but he built this company uh, that basically took on AT&T, and ultimately, it led to the breakup of the, of the, of the Bell, what's called the Bell Companies. Uh, and in my mind, uh, what he did really revolutionized, revolutionized the, the, uh, the, what I call the, the, the interactive media business in the U.S. today and perhaps across the world. Because once those companies were broken up, it created competition uh, within the U.S. market, which led to the, to the development of of, uh, in our country, it led to the development of the selling business, to the internet business, uh, to the cable business, and that really was the key. But Bill McGowan was the guy that built the team that took on AT&T. And I, when I, I didn't, I didn't, at that time, I was really my grand working directly. I worked for uh, about three levels down. But when I watched how he ran his business, ran that business, you know, having the fortitude, you know, we talk about you know management traits, things that make someone successful. I thought. Watching him take on uh, a giant, recognizing the needs of the public. I mean, people were complaining about uh, that business. I thought that was probably one of the more fundamental um, uh, uh, changes in our business. And I felt privileged having to have the opportunity to work with something like that. And, and I, the, the names in this room won't mean as much, but the people that you work for have gone on to start other businesses in the U.S. But it was really uh, identifying the market and building a team that works I mean, and, and that works so well together that made a difference. In fact, the people that I worked for in CI back then, we still in touch with today. It was such a cohesive team. Uh, but working together was, was, was an important part of that, and I thought that he really typified that. The second guy that I worked for, this was the, with the Florida Marlins baseball team, was Wayne Heisinger. Again, a name that may not resonate in this room, but if you Google him, again, yeah, you'll You'll be impressed with his background. Wayne Heisen was a guy that started a waste business in the U.S. And he took it public. And then he was bored. He started working on investing in these companies. He ended up investing in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, in a DVD company called Blockbuster Video. He grew that company into a uh, public company that became one of the most popular uh, and, and, and most, one of the largest you know, international you know, video chains in, in the country. But the point of that is that Wayne ended up not only taking those two companies public, but in his career, he ended up taking six companies from startup to 
New York Stock Exchange. Uh, an amazing entrepreneur, uh, similar to Bill McGowan. And what I found most interesting about Wayne, I did work for Wayne directly. Uh, and it goes back to the quote I read. Uh, he was a guy that in our meetings, and especially presentations, the one word you could never use was I. You could almost get fired if you said, this is what I did. His whole attitude was about we. Um, you know, for those of you who may have followed Apple and you see Steve Jobs from his keynotes, etc. Well, back in the 90s, without necessarily the same flair, Wayne Heisinger and Blockbuster Videos, annual meetings were like a Steve Jobs event back in the 90s. I mean, he had rock star status. But what I always, was always amazed about, watching him on the stage doing his annual share of his meetings, he would always say we. This is what our company did. This is what you all did. And I thought that was probably one of the most remarkable traits. And in working with him directly, he always focused on everyone down the line. I remember, in fact, we won the World Series in 1997. We had a big parade in Miami. And we had police cars and motorcycles lined up in front of the state to take us uh, on the parade route. He walks out, Wayne Heising, the owner of the team, this guy taking all these companies public, and he walks up to every single cop on the motorcycle, shaking their hand, how are you doing, I'm Wayne Heisinger, that's who this guy was. And I thought that probably, in answering the question, you know, what management tool, what management traits you know, best reflected my philosophy and what made the most impact of me, is that focus on working together, being collaborative, you know, thinking up and down the line about what's going on. Uh, in my own management style, I remember very, very, and I'll end on this, uh, on this note to take your questions. I remember having a woman, Ruby Matei was her name, and uh, she was this hardworking woman working in, in, in personnel for me. And early in my career, I remember uh, having a young woman work for me who complained to my boss, this was my first time managing staff, she complained to my boss about how I wasn't available to talk to them. I'm thinking to myself, I want you to, as a manager, I shouldn't be available to these people. And at the end of the day, I think she just needed more attention than most people. But I can't blame her for that. The point was, that's what she felt. I wasn't giving her enough of my time. And from that moment on, I said to myself, I'll never have an employee ever say they couldn't get access to me, ever. So, Ruby Matei, hardworking, uh, you know, just detail-driven person who's critical to my organization at the time. Um, I was going for a big project. Uh, I mean, literally traveling and not in the office at all. And while early I spent a lot of time with Ruben and other people in my accounting and finance and, and HR staff, I was probably kind of away, if you will, not in the office a lot, but probably weeks at a time. And one day I walked down to the office, uh, to, around the office, uh, and it kind of incorporates another phrase you may have heard in your uh, business training, MDWA. Anybody know what that is? MBWA, have you heard that before? It stands for Manage It By Walking Around. <laughs> Manage It By Walking Around. You can't just sit in your office. You got to get out and talk to people. The way nice to approach. And I remember one day, just, I don't know what struck me, but I thought, I haven't been down to the county office. I'm going to go down and say, just say hi to people. And I walked down, and Ruby's in her office, I go sit down, and when I do it, I don't want to just say, how are you doing? I want to really engage people. And I remember sitting there in front of Ruby, Ruby, how are you doing? Uh, um, you know, she was, well, tell me what's going on. Well, it turns out, she had had a really tough week, not just a tough day. And one of the things you also learn as a manager, and this is something you have to keep in mind as you start working for managers, people will start to assume certain things based on what you do or don't do, based on what you say or don't say. You can walk past somebody, just call up in your meeting and not speak to them, and they're thinking, oh my gosh, John's a hate now. He didn't speak to me. What's wrong? What's wrong? And they let that build up. And all of a sudden, you do exactly, oh my gosh, that's Christ, they didn't talk to me. What did I do? You go home worried, you know, my wife, oh gosh, what's going on, you know? He didn't talk to me today. Now, I didn't see him. I'm just, you know, MBWA deals with that. And so I ended up going down to sit with Ruby, 
what's going on, turns out she had a bad day, and because she hadn't seen me in weeks, she's thinking I hate her. Something went wrong, I didn't know about it, but she starts assuming that whatever went wrong, I knew about and was out to, you know. Long story short, she says, uh, we start talking about it, and long story short, she thinks that I was ready to quit. I'm like, what? You know, she said, I thought, I said, but, you know, and that taught me a lesson, how really important it is to talk to people. You know, and I can say in a very general way, talking to people is, is going to be important in any organization, but, you know, what I learned from that is the importance of really getting out and talking to people. Getting, you know, in, you know, in with the ranks, don't just assume, even at high level, that everything's going well and they don't need me. People always need me. And I get back to, you get anything you want, as long as you people what they want. And what Ruby needed was simply attention. To be valued, to be appreciated. And that's what Wayne Heisen nice does so, so well. And that's why he took six companies to the New York Stock Exchange and started. So, Mr. Glossop, that is my manager lesson that I'd like to share with students. And I know I will end my comments and take your questions.